Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this technical webinar on the World Energy Employment Report. My name is Jane Cohen, and I lead the people-centered team at the International Energy Agency. And I am joined today by the lead authors of the report, Rebecca Ruff, Michael McGovern, and Callie Andrews, um, who will answer questions and give um, a presentation of some of the key insights and findings of the report. Labor is really at the heart of our energy system and of course our clean energy system. And the World Energy Employment Report is one of the most important outputs of the IEA because it really helps capture the full picture of global energy employment, where we are now and where that employment is moving. And it serves as a guide for policymakers, for industry, and for labor, labor unions to really understand the dynamics within energy employment, where there needs to be more investment, where there needs to be more emphasis on training and skills, and where workers will need additional support as some jobs continue to transition. So I wanna quickly highlight three key findings from the report that are important to understanding some of these, these uh, dimensions within the energy sector. So the first is that energy employment once again outperformed the broader labor market trends. Um, and this is particularly true in clean energy, but in the energy sector as a whole. And um, as has been the, the case in recent years, this is driven primarily by manufacturing of clean energy technologies. But this growth is not spread evenly around the world. We're seeing more of this in advanced economies in China um, and, and less of this in emerging and developing economies. Now, the second uh, key trend that I want to bring up is that the report highlights the growing risk of uh, a shortage of skilled labor. Um, and this, this poses a particular risk to clean energy transitions, uh, and it really speaks to the need to bring more people into vocational training and to really have targeted programs to ensure that there is going to be the skilled workforce that's, that's necessary. Um, and the third is that the gender gap within energy employment continues. Um, in particular, we are seeing that um, women are underrepresented in the energy workforce as uh, compared to the economy as a whole. And this relates to the second point about labor shortages in that what we see is that if, if there can be targeted programs for women and also for people who are generally underrepresented in the energy workforce, there's a real opportunity to bring people into energy employment to build their economic development and to really widen the perspective in the innovation in the clean energy and the energy workforce as a whole. Now, despite the growth um, that, that we uh, highlight in the report, workers are still facing challenges and some communities are disproportionately affected by job losses. The IEA has convened a Clean Energy Labor Council, um, which brings together representatives of the world's most important labor unions to really foster dialogue between the IEA, the energy decision makers, and the labor sector. And members actively inputted this year into the report, giving their important perspectives on these issues. And they really stress the need for a process that facilitates discussion and partnership, and that has at its goal a clean energy transition that provides benefits and good jobs for workers. Now, the World Energy Employment Report is really the basis for these important discussions and give a really clear picture of the energy workforce that will shape the energy sector of tomorrow. So with that, let me hand it over to the team that wrote the report um, to give a presentation on the findings. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, so I'm Kaylee Andrews. I'm one of the lead authors of the report, and I'm going to start off just by giving an overview of energy employment today around the world. So the global energy sector added 2.5 million jobs in 2023 to exceed 67 million jobs uh, total, as we define it. Um, and over half of these workers are employed in clean energy sectors since it became the dominant source of energy employment, surpassing fossil fuels around 2021. Within clean power, within clean energy, you can see that power, including transmission and distribution, uh, storage and generation, accounts for the most jobs. Whereas in industries related to fossil fuels, uh, oil and gas supply is the largest employer, followed by internal combustion engine vehicle manufacturing. 
We also see a difference in where jobs are concentrated in the supply chain between clean and fossil fuel sectors. About a third of all clean energy jobs are in construction and installation, which, for example, includes workers who are installing heat pumps or solar panels or building wind farms. Uh, and on the other hand, fossil fuel jobs are more concentrated in the manufacturing sector. Uh, the bulk of these jobs, as you can see uh, from the left graph, are in ICE vehicle manufacturing. Uh, but this section also contains the manufacturing of petroleum fuels, aka refining, which is a significant contributor to employer. And finally, we could see that today over half of all energy employment is in the Asia Pacific region, led by China and India. This is particularly true for clean energy, uh, with Asia Pacific home to 60% of all clean energy jobs and about 50% for fossil fuels. And now I'd like to pass it over to my colleague, Rebecca, to explore how these dynamics are evolving in greater detail. Thank you, Kaylee. Now, looking at the growth uh, in employment in 2023, we see that uh, it's roughly split between clean and fossil fuel sectors. Oil and gas supply added the most jobs in 2023 with uh, nearly 600,000 workers. Uh, solar PV was the leading uh, sector in uh, clean energy uh, with record uh, investment, um, adding almost uh, half a million jobs. Now, when we look at vehicle manufacturing employment, we see it's split roughly evenly between internal combustion engines and electric vehicles and their batteries. Um, and that, that uh, growth was uh, significant, even though some manufacturers experienced uh, some um, uh, skill shortages in the manufacturing segment. Now, looking at other segments uh, of uh, growth, like grids, wind, and nuclear, they all witnessed uh, growth, but uh, with some various complication. Wind employment still, still climbed as record number of new projects entered construction, despite manufacturers experiencing a wave of uh, layoffs due to uncertainty in the project pipeline, especially in the uh, offshore segment. Grids and nuclear continue to face uh, stiff skill shortages, which are affecting the construction of new projects in uh, many regions. Now, looking at how this growth um, plays that played out in uh, different regions, we see a few different storylines. China continues to dominate job additions in many clean energy sectors, notably in clean manufacturing of solar PV, electric vehicles, uh, and their batteries. This is in part a function of the overall size of China, but it's also uh, a consequence of uh, their search forward in uh, clean energy, and in particular in clean energy manufacturing. And China has one of the highest rates of energy employment per capita of any major region, with 14 energy jobs per thousand people. Advanced economies also saw a large increase in energy jobs, uh, up from previous years, aided by continuous uh, new policy momentum. In other EMDs, uh, however, outside of China, we see little growth outside of fossil fuel sectors like internal combustion engines and uh, oil and gas extraction. And emerging markets and developing economies outside of China struggle to find a foothold in many of the leading clean energy sectors. Uh, and though the existing workforce in emerging, uh, emerging markets and developing economies is significant, most of the growth has taken place in just a few key markets, including India. And this is why a focus of this year's report has been to answer the question of whether or not clean energy jobs are materializing in emerging markets and developing economies. And with that, I will let Michael um, delve into more details about the topic. Uh, thanks very much, Rebecca. So um, as Rebecca mentioned, a key focus for our report this year was um, the progress in clean energy employment in emerging markets and developing economies. Um, I'll, I'll refer to them as EMDEs. Um, and to assess the progress and, 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 and look at some of the underlying trends. So if we look at the split of the global labor force among these uh, these three blocks, we can see that uh, emerging market and developing economies account for about three-fifths of uh, the global labor force. But when we look at clean energy jobs, they account for only around two-fifths of clean energy jobs. And so um, we wanted to dive a bit deeper into the numbers and understand what's, what's going on uh, beneath this disparity. So there's an important sectoral dimension to this, uh, to these trends. So if we look at raw materials, for instance, uh, in clean energy, this includes um, bioenergy supply. It includes critical minerals uh, and also hydrogen. 
we can see that, in fact, uh, EMDs are, have been relatively successful. They have a comparative advantage in this sector. They account for around three quarters of uh, global jobs. Um, so we we, uh, we all know that, um, in particular, we're thinking about Southeast Asia, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, and uh, South America are important sort of sources of these uh, clean energy materials. But if we look at the rest of the sectors, and in particular at manufacturing, we see that there's not the same story. And in fact, um, EMDs are, have, in particular in manufacturing, uh, fallen behind. Um, they account for only a quarter of um, clean energy manufacturing jobs. And importantly, um, uh, these, excuse me, Manufacturing is an important um, growth sector relative to raw materials. So the, the fact that EMDs have had success in raw materials, um, if we're looking forward to uh, 2030 in the step scenario, which is a stated policy scenario, um, the gains in jobs seen in that scenario on a global scale are much smaller than in manufacturing. So uh, we see only around uh, half a million jobs added in raw materials, whereas in manufacturing, three million jobs are added. And that um, is, a, is a gain of 45%. So um, our report asks the question of like, how can uh, emerging market and developing economies uh, gain more success in this sector and, and capture more of these clean energy manufacturing jobs? So in addition to a focus on emerging market and developing economies, our uh, report also features um, uh, chapters which focus on a deep dive on particular sectors looking at, global, at a global level. Um, so we wanted to pick out some important trends that we're seeing in uh, some of these sectors. So I'm going to start by talking about um, the vehicle sector. So our report includes um, estimates uh, across uh, internal combustion engine vehicle manufacturing, electric vehicles, and electric uh, vehicle batteries. So if we look at the regional split of industrial uh, uh, ICE vehicle manufacturing, we can see that the split across countries is relatively even. So looking at North America, at Europe, at China, India, and Southeast Asia account for uh, a reasonably even proportion of jobs in uh, across the world in this sector. But when we look at EVs, it's a, it's a different story. So uh, we see that China is uh, has established a sort of dominant position in these two sectors, especially in electric vehicle uh, battery manufacturing. And um, although at the moment, as you can see from the, the, the total jobs in each of these sectors, um, ICE vehicle manufacturing is, is, is by far the more important employer, um, this uh, trend is beginning to change. And we can start to see that if we, if we look next at the trends over the last few years. So this chart shows the development uh, uh, since 2019, uh, the change in jobs in each of these sectors. Um, so. One important uh, factor to remember here is that uh, this includes the effects of the, the period of the COVID pandemic. So in 2020, there was a strong fall in vehicle sales across the world. And since then, there has been a slow recovery to those 2019 levels. Um, so despite what uh, you see here, where there has been a, a loss in ICE vehicle jobs in every region, um, the, the short-term trend is still upwards. But still, I think this is an interesting dimension to look at this and, and see that actually this um, uh, decline in ICE vehicle jobs seen since 2019 is uh, has been seen in every region of the world. Every region of the world has seen between has lost between five to 15 percent of its uh, ICE vehicle manufacturing jobs. And as you might expect, when we add EVs and EV batteries to this list, which has been a strong growth sector, the uh, regional split is much more much less evenly distributed. So China has added um, 1.2 million jobs in this sector, in these sectors uh, since 2019, and uh, no other region in the world has added more than 0.2 million. And so as a result, we can see that from the net gains that China is the only region in the world to have seen a net gain in this sector um, uh, over this period. And so this is like, um, I think this chart brings out quite clearly um, the, this kind of changing regional dimension of, of, of employment in this particular sector. Um, so with that, I'll pass over to my colleague. Next slide. 
Thank you, Michael. Now, looking at the power sector, we see employment exceeded 21 million in uh, 2023, with over 80% employed in grids or clean power generation technologies. Grids, which include transmission, distribution, and storage, is the largest employer in the uh, power sector with over 8 million workers. However, grids employment has only been slowly growing at about 3% year on year compared to 13%, for instance, for solar PV. Ongoing labor shortages in the manufacturing of grid equipment, but also lack of specialized electrician, technicians, engineers, and construction workers has led to longer lead times uh, for a number of new projects. And this is presenting headwinds for many countries who are urgently trying to address uh, the lack in grid extensions to integrate new renewables. The remaining power sector workforce, around 30 million workers, is in clean energy technologies and uh, fossil fuels with around th three, three quarters employed in uh, clean power technologies. Some sectors experience record growth, like solar PV, uh, as I just mentioned, but other sectors like hydropower and nuclear witnessed slower growth. Hydropower in particular is the second largest uh, employer after solar PV and power generation, but aging demographics and a lack of policy support is creating uncertainty for the future of the workforce. In addition, um, industry interviews we conducted this year echo challenges in recruiting uh, young talents um, for a number of different reasons, including the lack of specialized vocational programs, but also the remote location of the hydropower plants. Now, looking at the split by asset type, we see that more than half of the workers are involved in developing new projects, which includes uh, the manufacturing of uh, grid equipment and the construction installations of power plants, dams, uh, grids, and mounting systems. Over 85% of uh, workers in the development and building of new infrastructure and capacity are in clean energy sectors. And in contrast, when looking at the right side of the graph, uh, almost 70% of workers in fossil fuel power are employed in the operation and maintenance uh, of existing plants. Grids have a bit of a different split uh, than clean power generation technologies with around 60% of jobs in transmission and distribution segments uh, in the operation and maintenance. This is in part due to the large existing capacity and the associated workers needed for uh, the response to outages, customer connections, uh, but also meter reading. And this is a result of, of previously mentioned um, headwinds and the strain on the development of new power grids projects. But in countries that have experienced uh, rapid expansion of their grids, uh, the share of workers in the manufacturing uh, and construction can be much higher in China, for example, construction workers alone account for around 40% of grid employment. With that, I will pass it on to my colleague, Kelly. Thanks so much, Rebecca. Uh, now I'd like to take it a bit uh, farther upstream uh, to one of the oldest uh, contributors to energy employment, and that's coal supply, which today uh, employs over 6 million people. Uh, that's about a fifth of all fossil fuel employment. And what we're looking at here is coal production employment, um, which is people working directly in the production of coal. And we have about another 1.5 million workers in upstream transport of coal as well. But today, right here, we're just looking at production. So in 2019, there were uh, a bit over 5 million people working in coal production. Um, but between 2019 and 2023, the global coal output has increased 10%. This implies an increase in the number of people working to actually produce the coal. And we estimate that all else held equal, about 450,000 workers would have been hired uh, in order to enable this increase in production between these two years. But there is another factor that heavily influences the size of the coal supply workforce, and that's labor productivity. Uh, simply put, the amount of output that a given worker can produce. Various factors drive labor productivity improvements, but the most dominant variables are mechanization and automation. Coal mining is a prime candidate for automation and mechanization because of its capital intensity, the routine nature of its work, and the hazards it presents for workers. So providing workers with better equipment, aka mechanization, or replacing them altogether with machines, automation, tends to improve overall safety and working conditions by removing workers from inherently hazardous environments, although it does obviously have a negative effect on the number of jobs. Labor productivity in the coal supply sector is constantly rising uh, as companies pursue these improvements, which tend to drive down costs and, as I said, improve safety. 
So since 2019, we estimate that over 700,000 coal production jobs have been rendered completely redundant by labor productivity improvements. This means that for every one job that would have been added due to that 10% increase in production that I mentioned, about 1.6 jobs were eliminated by productivity measures, resulting in lower coal production employment in 2023 than in 2019, despite higher, how, higher output. So looking at these patterns regionally can help to illustrate the various effects that productivity have depending on geography. Here we've indexed everything to 2019. So a value of one is equivalent to 2019 levels. 1.2 is 20% higher and so on and so forth. Um, and after coal production and employment both dipped in 2020, as you can see here due to the pandemic, continuous productivity improvements have mostly decoupled these variables. Much of this trend reflects what we're seeing in China and India, which together account for over 80% of all global coal supply employment. Uh, China's coal production has risen about 20% since 2019, but the number of coal miners has fallen by a similar share over the same period. This is uh, not an accident. It's in thanks to long-term centralized nationwide efforts to consolidate hundreds of smaller, less efficient mines uh, that's been ongoing since the mid-2000s, and a newer focus on the development of intelligent mines, which rely heavily on automation and aim to minimize the number of coal miners underground eventually to zero. India, on the other hand, has not uh, made these same long-term centralized efforts to automate as China has, and as a result, its coal sector is much less mechanized than China or other advanced economies today which is also the case for Indonesia and other major coal mining regions um, among emerging market and developing economies. So today we see around 14 times more workers required per ton of coal produced in India than in the United States, and about 3.5 times more than in China. This does mean, however, that in India, as well as in Indonesia and other coal regions, that there's a lot of room for relatively easy improvement. So taking even small or lower hanging productivity me measures has eliminated India's need to expand their coal mining workforce, even as coal production has jumped nearly 40% since 2019. And finally, we can look at advanced economies who have seen the biggest decrease in coal mining employment over the time period, down over 35% since 2019. And productivity improvements have actually played a smaller part in this decrease than in all the other geographies shown here for a few reasons. reasons. Uh, first, advanced economies are the only geography I've shown here that have actually reduced coal production since 2019. This means that unlike the other regions, part of the decline in jobs has been driven by simply less coal mining happening in the first place. It also means that these regions are not seeing as many productivity improvements because they're less likely to invest the capital needed in measures to improve productivity since most of them are planning on phasing out coal anyway or are already in the process of doing so. And in addition, the productivity in these regions is already very high compared to in most emerging market and developing economies. Uh, most countries in this aggregate have been mining coal for a very long time, and they've already adopted most of the productivity measures available. So all this means is that the global uh, future coal workforce will be shaped by emerging and developing economies, especially in Asia. And these coal sectors will in turn be shaped by productivity improvements and the rate of technology innovation and adoption as much as they will be by coal transitions and efforts to move away from coal in the power sector. So finally, I'll turn it back over to Rebecca to examine an aspect of energy employment that's relevant, not just to coal, but to all sectors and regions. Thank you, Katie. So with these last few slides, we'd like to touch upon the topic of gender that Jane also mentioned in the introduction of this presentation. Um, so the energy industry has historically been um, male dominated, despite accounting for 39% of the global labor force women make up less than 20% of the energy industry in 2023. However, the transition to clean energy offers opportunities to improve the gender imbalance with some segments already having higher shares of women than traditional fossil fuel sectors, for instance, in the solar PV industry, women make up 40% um, of the workforce, which is nearly double what uh, the oil and gas workforce uh, shares is. Um, and looking now at senior leadership position, we see that um, on average, uh, clean energy sectors tend to do better than the industry average, um, but that's uh, not true for all key uh, um, industries like wind, which is only marginally higher than uh, fossil fuel sectors and below uh, the industry average. 
Now, another key point we'd like to uh, touch upon today is vocational jobs. Um, many trades uh, occupations tend to have a very low share of women economy-wide, so energy sectors that require higher shares of these workers tend to have larger imbalances. For example, in some key occupations like roofers or electricians, women represent less than 3% uh, of the workers. And narrowing the gender imbalance depends also on increasing the number of women entering vocational programs relevant to the energy industry. Thank you very much uh, for your attention. Okay, thank you very much to our uh, our team of lead authors. That was uh, very informative. Um, so I'd like to ask um, uh, people in the room and people online, you know, please um, put your questions into the chat. Um, I already have a few, so let me um, kick off by um, by asking this question that we got, which is, um, are emerging jobs in EMDEs of higher quality than existing ones? Yes, I'll take this one. Um, thank you very much. So as we mentioned in the presentation, uh, a key uh, focus of this year's report has been to address whether uh, clean energy jobs are materializing in emerging markets and developing economies. But we've also uh, analyzed whether even if these jobs do materialize, what is the quality of these jobs? Um, we've had uh, numerous discussion with labor representatives over the last year, which echoed concern that these jobs do not necessarily bring local value and are of high quality. Uh, so we um, analyzed a few different factors, including informality, uh, wages, uh, collective bargaining agreements, contract length. And we found that um, for some clean energy sectors, uh, especially in the solar and wind industry, contract lengths tends to be uh, a concern because the projects are linked to installation. So the contracts tend to be shorter than uh, traditional fossil fuel sectors, for instance. Uh, and longer term contracts tend to bring more stability for the workers. Uh, we've also addressed uh, informality in a number of sectors uh, and the role of collective bargaining agreement in ensuring that the uh, workplace is uh, safer. So to summarize the question, we not only ask ourselves whether clean energy jobs are materializing, but also what the quality, uh, what the job quality is for the workers. Uh, and we continue to have uh, close collaboration with labor representatives to ensure that governments see these this time of transformation as an opportunity uh, for um, to create local value and uh, better livelihood for the citizens. Great, thank you so much, Rebecca. Um, all right, we have another question. Um, you pointed out that over half of all energy jobs are in clean energy segments, especially power, but the world still mostly runs on fossil fuels. Doesn't that just mean that clean energy is less efficient? Who would like to take that from the panel? I can take that one. Uh, so it's a good point. Uh, we do say that since 2021, about uh, over half of the energy workforce is involved in clean energy segments. I think it's 52% today. But obviously, fossil fuels are still the dominant source of power generation, of uh, the dominant fuel for vehicles, etc. Um, but in short, no, this doesn't mean that clean energy is necessarily more labor intensive or less efficient. Uh, and that's because of the different distribution of jobs across the supply chain and what kind of activities people are working on in these different sectors. So if you think back to the figure that my colleague Rebecca presented earlier, um, you're comparing how much of the workforce is engaged in existing capacity or developing new ca capacity by technology. You'll remember that most clean energy sectors have a much higher share of people working on developing new capacity. Those are people manufacturing solar panels, building wind farms, etc. In fossil fuels, on the other hand, we have much greater existing capacity and we aren't seeking to build out new capacity as much. So more people on that side work in the operations. Uh, construction activities do tend to be a lot more labor intensive than operating existing assets, which has resulted in clean energy becoming the leading employer years before it's becoming the dominant source of fuel or electricity. Uh, this does mean that not all the clean energy jobs we see today are permanent. Uh, obviously, once you finish building a power plant uh, or installing a heat pump, you're not going to uh, maintain employment for the person who is doing the task that's now finished. 
Uh, however, you do now need workers to maintain and operate that power plant to manage transmission of the electricity it generates and so on and so forth. So over the longer term, when we're no longer in a big rush to install new clean energy capacity and build out clean energy infrastructure, uh, we do expect to see a greater rebalancing of clean energy employment towards operating existing assets. But with the rate that uh, electricity demand is going to continue to rise in coming years, I wouldn't expect to see a big drop in construction employment anytime soon. Um, and one other thing I'll add is that when it comes to operating existing assets, the labor intensity uh, required to operate a given megawatt of capacity varies widely depending on the type of technology. Uh, solar panels, for instance, are notable in this regard uh, because they don't move, unlike most other generating technologies. And as a result, they experience much less wear and tear and require much less maintenance. Uh, but this is a factor that across all technologies is going to be heavily influenced by technological advances, similar to the productivity measures I mentioned earlier for coal. Uh, we still don't know exactly how innovations in technology, including artificial intelligence, are going to affect the employment intensity of operating clean energy assets down the line. Um, and that's something that we're looking forward to exploring in greater detail in next year's report, where we'll be extending the time horizon of our modeling from 2030 to 2035, so we can get a bit of a better view into some of these long-term trends. Thanks. Great, thank you so much for that for that answer. Um, all right, and the next one that we have is, um, and Michael, I think this one might be for you. What can EMDEs do to gain more clean energy manufacturing jobs? Right, uh, thank you, Jane. Um, yeah, so this is something that we, we looked at a little bit in our report. Um, so, um, yeah, in a sense, this is sort of the, the trillion dollar question in a way. Um, how can we attract um, more jobs and investment into, into EMDs? So um, I think um, an obvious answer that jumps to mind is, uh, you know, if, if you want more jobs in uh, clean energy in EMDs, um, it's, it's a question of a lack of investment in these countries. Um, but then that raises itself the, you know, the question of, um, why has there been a lack of investment? And I think you could jump into a, a many, many different factors that we could list. Um, you know, we could we could think about um, infrastructure concerns for investors. We could think about sort of the reliability and, and cost of energy supply in these countries, um, institutional factors. Um, so in our report, we, we sort of tried to focus as much as we could on labor market concerns. And so an important factor here is, is, is local skills and supply of local skilled uh, workforce. Um, and so um, we do know that in EMDs, you know, um, achievement of tertiary education and in particular vocational education is lower than elsewhere in the world. Um, so um, in a sense, that is a concern. Um, and I think for investors, that's an important factor. So we've seen cases where um, uh, foreign investors have invested in EMDs and brought in their own, the companies have brought in their own work workforce um, to fill skilled positions. Um, and so while that's a success for the, uh, for the local economy in terms of the investment and, and, and uh, uh, what that brings to the local economy, it's not necessarily generating local jobs. Um, so obviously there needs to be a kind of renewed focus on, on skills development in these economies. Um, but also I think there's a role for international cooperation here. So um, we can think of like the, the role of technical assistance from um, uh, advanced economies, um, but also from the, the, the private sector as well. You know, we've seen um, examples of um, the so-called build, own, operate, transfer model where um, uh, foreign companies would uh, come in and uh, establish a facility, operate it, run it, and transfer skills to the local populace and uh, to the local workforce, and, uh, and then uh, transfer ownership to to uh, uh, local owners um, and so that's a model that uh, can allow for this sort of skills transfer um, which is so important but I think you know I'd, I'd repeat the point that like skills is not is not the only factor here I think we've seen many examples um, in the last sort of 50 100 years of cases in emerging market and developing economies which had very skilled workforces um, and yet where this kind of manufacturing base didn't uh, uh, build up or didn't persist. You know, you, for example, you could think of in, in Latin America in the 60s and 70s, there was a strong um, manufacturing base there. 
and, and, and uh, following the debt crisis that happened in the 1980s, um, that was something that didn't really um, uh, carry through into the, into the subsequent decades. So having a skilled workforce is a necessary condition, but it's not sufficient. We need other factors too. Um, so yeah, thanks. Thanks, Michael. And that's a really important uh, topic to, to, I think, be bringing up and, and thinking about in as our as we talk about kind of developing clean energy and, and ensuring that there are benefits for people around the world. Um, all right, we have another question. The report mentions that the impacts of job losses will be disproportionately felt at the local level. What do transitions look like for these workers? Um, so if the panel doesn't mind, I think I'll take that one. <laughs> um, so we are seeing some communities that uh, are or will be disproportionately uh, impacted by the phase out of uh, fossil fuel jobs. Um, and different regions, different countries are addressing this in different ways. But what we really do see is that really robust and inclusive planning at the national, regional and local level is essential. Um, and this has to be done uh, in cooperation between government industry and labor. And that is really, really the key. Um, some other important points are industry policy, um, which can help ensure that uh, that workers are able to um, transition into high quality jobs. Uh, economic diversification strategies are also really important to revive local economies and secure sustainable local growth. And also to make sure that communities, which you know we know, especially in a lot of these uh, coal communities, the, the income of the community is really dependent on those jobs. So thinking about how to revitalize the local economy so that those communities can stay intact is really important. Also, labor market policies are needed um, to ensure that displaced workers receive social protection and, and that they are um, being connected with training and, um, and, and reskilling. Um, but just to, to say, you know, that's not the only piece. I think sometimes it's easy for us just to say skilling, reskilling, but it, it's, it's really more, uh, it takes a, a bigger strategy than that. Um, and so delivering this work, for, uh, this support for displaced workers requires, um, as Michael said, a lot of international cooperation and, and kind of sharing of best practices and dialogue between government, industry, and labor. And just to say that um, to address this, um, the IEA convened a new global commission on people-centered clean energy transitions this year, um, which we call Designing for Fairness. And it's co-chaired by uh, the Brazilian Minister of Mines and Energy um, and Minister Teresa Ribeira of Spain. Um, and under Brazil and Spain's leadership, um, we're really looking at what kinds of actionable actionable policy recommendations um, can we put forth and can and governments and other policymakers really put into place to ensure that workers and really communities around the world are benefiting from clean energy transitions. Um, so um, with that, let me ask, do we have any questions from folks in the room? Yes, please. Uh, thank you for your presentation. I have one question that came to mind when I saw one of uh, Michael's uh, slide on transport, mm -hmm. where you showed uh, how many jobs were lost in traditional for traditional vehicles and how many were gained for EVs. And now I had just one question: Is there any sub substitution, like uh, from traditional vehicles to going to EVs, mm -hmm. or um, in general, how many jobs were lost in the traditional vehicle sector? Thank you. Thanks, uh, Nicholas. I, I think I'll take that on. Um, so I think there is some overlap here. Um, I think it depends. Obviously, vehicle manufacturing is an extremely complex um, uh, process with many sort of subparts and so on. And that's why it's sort of it's possible that this is something that can be distributed you know, across the world or across a region where there's these sort of just in time supply chains um, and so on. Um, so there are certain facets of that manufacturing process which are transferable, you know, the sort of the, 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 um, the body of a car is essentially going to be the same, regardless of what the drivetrain is, right? And I think um, it, uh, some analysis that we've seen has, has shown that actually a majority of the jobs involved in vehicle manufacturing are in those kinds of like sort of uh, those components of a vehicle, which are the same across EVs and, uh, 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 and ICE vehicles. 
Um, but obviously, then the drive chain is, is, is a different thing, right? So battery manufacturing is very specific. And it's very difficult to engine manufacturing. And then that's attached to a whole drive train, which is connected to the, how the, 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 the motor itself. Um, and so that's obviously something where we're seeing specializations develop in different places, and in particular in China, obviously, where um, they've, they've uh, uh, taken the lead in, in this sector. Um, so I think to some extent, yes, there is some transferability just because the job is going to be the same. And in other sense, in another sense, no. I think you know the the engine manufacturing for an internal combustion engine, and the battery manufacturing for an EV is a, just a completely different uh, field. Um, so in that sense, if uh, a, a country which has an existing capacity in internal combustion engine vehicle manufacturing wants to gain a foothold in the EV market as well, they need to sort of build a new industry in a sense. So um, yes, so yes and no, I guess is the answer. Any other questions from our, yes, please. Yes, thank you for the presentation and for taking my question. So uh, I have a question on the shortage of skilled labor uh, that you mentioned as one of the uh, important uh, finding of the report. I, I was wondering in which region or where this shortage is happening, if it was more in advanced economies, China, or well, I guess in EMDs as there are some shortages, maybe it's also the case. And also for which, type of jobs was this related? Uh, was it more for a clean energy or fossil fuels or both? Or... Thank you. Great question. Thanks for asking. There's a lot uh, to cover here. Um, in short, most regions, at pretty much every region of the world is seeing at least one kind of shortage of skilled labor somewhere in clean energy. Probably the most prominent one um, is that in advanced economies, especially in North America and Western Europe, we see a significant um, shortage of skilled labor in construction and installation jobs. The vocational trades that we've talked about earlier, these are people that went to vocational training for you know, uh, being a welder, electrician, construction worker, et cetera. So these are really in structural short supply. They've like in the EU, these kind of jobs have been topping the list of shortage occupations for years. It's the same case in the United States and Canada. Um, and this is affecting the broader construction industry as well as the energy industry, which is particularly hard hit because it generally requires people uh, with those base certifications to upskill a little more and specialize further. So we already have a shortage in the general pool uh, that implies an even greater shortage in the pool of specialized workers. And this is something we've heard um, from the surveys and the energy companies we've been talking to uh, this year. We ran a survey of over 190 energy employers, and construction and installation was by far, according to them, the worst hit by shortages. Um, this is the uh, sector in which they had the greatest difficulty hiring. In EMDEs, as Michael mentioned, there might not be as acute pressing shortages because the specific jobs aren't growing as quickly. But in these regions, it's more of a case of the general skill level of the workforce tends to be a bit lower. Uh, we broadly can associate skill level with educational attainment, which is generally uh, lower in the broader population and therefore the labor force in these regions. Um, and then I'll add in uh, China and other countries that have a focus on manufacturing, although, of course, China is not just focused on manufacturing. Um, but I'd say this is really the source of a lot of the uh, clean energy infrastructure and equipment that we're using. And in these areas, we're not seeing as much of an acute shortage in construction and installation, but there is a larger structural uh, skilled labor shortage facing the manufacturing sector, actually. Um, it's not the case that there's simply not enough people to go into those jobs. There are. Um, the issue is that uh, fewer and fewer people are choosing to work in factories. Um, they'd like to work, you know, uh, white collar jobs in offices or in civil service instead. So although the actual uh, labor force is sufficient to cover the jobs, um, we're seeing a structural shortage where China's factories are having uh, difficulties filling positions. Um, there's many, I could go on and on in sectors. It's not just clean energy. Oil and gas is also actually in some regions facing a shortage of highly skilled workers. Um, they have some of the most elevated skill requirements and wages of the entire energy industry and the broader economy. 
Um, but like uh, other legacy sectors like nuclear and hydro, uh, oil and gas is facing an aging out of the workforce where they've hired so many of these people decades ago and they're leaving now, retiring and taking most of their knowledge with them. So in short, uh, most of the energy industry is afflicted by skill shortages in one way or another. Thanks. Thanks, Kelly. And um, we only had 45 minutes for, for this webinar. And unfortunately, our time is coming to a close. Um, but I think um, the, the report as as we've seen today, really forms the basis of information, data, um, analysis on this really critical issue. And I have to say, I was at COP last week, and it was really a, a, a topic of conversation kind of across the board was this question of, you know, where is the workforce? Is there a workforce? What will the jobs be? Um, and so um, I think the team here has has just put forth a great contribution to this topic that is that is extremely important. The bad news is that we have to wait another year for 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 the next one. Um, but in the meantime, the IEA um, is putting out a number of reports on on issues that touch on some of these topics. For example, gender, labor, some of the obviously the technical areas um, that we cover here. Um, so there's lots of information to be had, um, and we look forward to to continuing the discussion. So thank you very much everyone for joining us today.